and I assume he ought to move because I prayed a certain way and I fasted a certain way. That's not a man that's blessed, but a man that's blessed is a man that says, I trust God. Amen. Hey, glory to God. Not I trust the money that God gave me, I trust the job that God keeps me on, I trust the relationship that God keeps me in, but I trust God. Yes. Listen to what he says. The results of a man that trusts God like that. Verse 80 said, He is like a tree. Watch this. Planted along a river bank. You, you gotta grab this this morning. This tree does not just show up at the river bank. It is purposely and intentionally planted by the river bank. It is planted by a source of ready water. It is planted close to the resource that it needs. It is planted, hallelujah, it is put there. You got to understand God has planted you where he has planted you. You have not been strewn there. You have not been cast there. You have not been thrown there. You were in a tree that just popped up there like a That's weed. Right. You were planted by God. It says, with its roots reaching deep into the water, a tree, watch this, not bothered by the heat. Oh, glory to God. How I mean, some of us are going through a hot situation right now. Heat is on our lives. Heat of unemployment. The heat of lack of funds. The heat of being cooped up in our homes. The heat of broken relationships. But he says, you ain't bothered by the heat. Tell your neighbor, I got some stuff in my life oh, that's yes. causing me heat. That's causing me uncomfortability. That's causing me stress. That's causing me frustration. But I ain't bothered by it. That's right. Says he's a tree, not bothered by the heat, not worried by long months of drought. Watch this. You got to pay attention to the text. I love how the text is written. It is very specific. It is very particular. It says long months of drought. I, I know I'm talking to some people. I know some of your stories and you've been going through long seasons of struggle and long seasons of lack and long seasons of doubt and long seasons of worry. But God says in the midst of that, hallelujah, you're still blessed. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, he concludes and says, Jesus. its leaves you, Jesus. stay green. Watch this. You missed it just now. Hallelujah. That's an oxymoron. How long, how come can it go through seasons of heat and long months of drought without water, but it still has green leaves? Yes. I've come to declare to somebody, you are still producing regardless of what it seems like you're losing in your life. Regardless of what it seems that you're lacking in your life. If you really examine your life, you are winning. That's why you got people in your life that's mad at you that look at your life and wondering why you're not crying like they're crying and wondering why you're not going through like they're going through and wondering why you're not why you're not emotional like they're emotional why because you still have green leaves watch this that's not the powerful thing because green leaves can be just a show but it says it still it leaves its leaves stay green and it goes right on producing. Oh, glory to God. Somebody under the sound of my voice this morning, you better write that in your comment line this morning. I still keep producing. Hallelujah. Regardless of what's going on around me. Regardless of what's going on in the environment. Regardless of who's dying on my left and dying on my right. Regardless of who's thrown in the towel. My leaves are still green and I'm still bearing fruit. Mm. So it goes right on producing <laughs> all its luscious fruit. You know, I grew up in the Caribbean and, and we had fruit trees in our yard. We had a gooseberry tree. Most of you from, from America might not understand what that is, but it, it was a type of fruit that would produce a jam or jelly. We had a gooseberry tree. We had a papaw tree. We had a soursop tree. We had pomegranates. We had cherry trees, cherry vines in the backyard. Hallelujah. Uh, and one thing about that tree in the backyard, the nicest and the sweetest looking 
fruit usually was on the highest branches. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get to it. Hallelujah. The birds got to it faster than us. Or it hit the ground faster than we can get to it. Hallelujah. And we had to be bold enough, humble enough to take it off the ground, wipe it off, and still consume it. I've come to declare to somebody, sometimes your best fruit will hit the ground unnoticed. Folk won't realize how powerful you are and they will scorn you because they see the fruit right up under your tree. But I'm declaring just because you lost that fruit, that doesn't mean you're not going to stop producing. Yes, that's uh, right. Yes. It says producing Hallelujah. all its luscious fruit. That's the blessed man according to Jeremiah. Philippians 4 according to Paul talking to the Philippian church just two verses there, the eighth and the ninth verse, he says, as he closes this letter to the Philippian church, he wants to encourage the believers in Philippi. I want to encourage the believers listening to this recording or listening to this live this morning. He says, and now brothers, as I close this letter, let me say this one more thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and good and right. I, I, what is Paul saying to the Philippian church? Paul is telling the Philippian church, get out of stinking thinking. Oh, hallelujah. So many of us are guilty of stinking thinking. We have become victims of stinking thinking. And not only not stinking thinking of others, but stinking thinking of ourselves. Thinking that we're, woe is me. And I ain't nobody. And I ain't nothing. And I'm little. And you always dwelling on the stuff, the mistakes you made in your life. But he says, think about things that are pure. Think about things that are lovely yeah. and dwell on the fine good things in others. Watch this. He says, don't even just think about the good things in you. I need you to change your thinking about others. Yeah. Get out of this competition. Yeah. Get out of this comparison. No. Get out of this. I got to do better. Get out of this one upman right. shit. That's Get right. out of that mentality. Paul says, think of good things in others. Think about all you can praise God for and be glad about. Watch this. He says, you got to find some praise partners that you can exchange stuff together and talk about the goodness of the Lord and how together you can praise him. Oh, yes. Verse 9 says, keep putting into practice into practice all you learned from me and saw me doing and the God of peace will be with you. He says there is a consequence to doing what I'm telling you to do. He says if you act like I'm, I'm telling you to act and behave like I'm telling you to behave and switch like I'm telling you to switch. He says God will be with you and not just God but the God of peace will be with you. The God that brings peace to chaos and calm to confusion. That God will be with you. Amen. So Jeremiah tells us what it takes to be a blessed man. What it takes to keep producing even in droughts and in heat. What it takes to keep producing fruitful, be, being fruitful and, and producing luscious fruit. He tells us what we ought to do. Now Paul is telling us if we do some other things, what God will do on our behalf. He'll give us peace. Amen. That word there is the shalom of God. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Final portion of scripture is from Jesus' lips. Matthew chapter 17, the gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, the seventh chapter, the 24th verse, just three verses there, rather four verses there. He says, all who listen to my instructions and follow them are wise like a man who builds his house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floods rise and the storm winds beat against his house, it won't collapse. For it is built 
on rock. But those who hear my instructions and ignore them are foolish. God, Jesus here, uh, God in the flesh, calls men foolish who don't listen and who rather ignore his word. It is one thing to hear his word. It's one thing to listen to his word. It's one thing to be a hearer of the word. It's another thing to be a doer of the word. He says they're foolish. Then they're like a man who builds his house on sand. For when the rains and floods come and storm winds beat against his house, it says it will fall with a mighty crash. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. We end reading it, but we're going to go back to referencing it in a little bit. I want to speak for the thought this morning. In our theme, A Cure for the Afflicted Mind, the, th the thought this morning is staying committed in a crisis. Woo! Staying committed. Yeah, now, I just did a gesture for you. Commitment is about holding hands. Staying committed in a crisis. Sticking it out when everyone else is throwing in the towel, holding on when the world is saying let go because you only live once is difficult to do. As, as, as creatures of habit, as creatures of belonging, as creatures of community, we long to be a part of something that we are familiar with, one. Number two, that we perceive to be greater than ourselves. Number three, no, number two rather. Uh, and regardless of it, that something is not necessarily beneficial or good for us to begin with. And sticking something out in a space where we feel as though we are alone in the struggle is difficult. Can I go a little deeper this morning? Sticking out, raising a child all alone is difficult. Sticking out, uh, building a business with little to no help is difficult. Staying the course when everyone else seems to be taking the closest exit, leaving you looking down the road as if the road has no end to it, is hard in life. For example, committing, listen, to celibacy mm -hmm. in a sex-crazed world is viewed sometimes as absolute insanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, am I am I talking to people that know what I'm talking about this morning? Hallelujah. And as a result, even those that want to do it God's way, they find themselves backpedaling because it appears that everybody else is not keeping themselves and they are making out quite all right. Listen to the language I just used. It appears that everybody else is doing what they want to do and they're coming out good and fine. And you have made up in your mind you're going to keep yourself. But because everybody else isn't keeping themselves, I'm going to compromise. It ain't easy. It's not only limited to sexual intercourse. It can be an education. Who wants to go to school and pay attention to a teacher and do papers and tests and quizzes and assignments when everybody else is saying, hey, you know, get you a little side gig, get you a little job, make a little money. Hallelujah. I didn't like school anyway, and I'm still successful. When you're surrounded by that mentality that tells you always look for a shortcut out of and a shortcut to the things that you're desiring to do, and that hard work and perseverance and stick to it and are old fashioned life will continue to be difficult. Uh, um, if most of us would be brutally honest, staying committed to a cause in a culture that is fickle and always searching for the next big thing is challenging to say the least and almost impossible to say the worst. 
That is why get rich quick schemes and pyramid kinds of activities where you are promised to make a whole lot of money if you could get other people to sign up are making such a strong comeback in our season. However, wisdom affords us the understanding that commitment, perseverance, and stick to are attributes that separate the truly successful from those that look successful but lack significance and substance. You know them. I'm calling no names, but this is the year or the season of the reality TV star. Most of them have a lot of stuff mm -hmm. over to God. But they ain't got no integrity. That's right. Their characters are so deeply flawed. But because of those deeply flawed characters, they're somehow making buku bucks. And people are watching their lives and being entertained by the dysfunction. But God, the devil is a liar. I dare not allow my life to become a laughing stock so that I can make a couple of dollars and die in depression. The Amen. devil is a liar. Amen. No. Hallelujah. We don't even have to go as far as biographies. If you look at the biographies of the world and you read them, it's always a story of perseverance, stick-to-itiveness, and commitment to something that most other people around those people didn't even recognize. Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Steve Jobs, to name a few. If you read their biographies, there's, there's a running narrative of them persevering, being committed, and sticking to something that sometimes didn't make sense in the eyes of the people around them, people that love them, people that care for them, people that were concerned for them, that were tell them, you're crazy, you're out of your mind to continue doing that after making, after trying and failing at it so for so long, and I've come to declare to somebody, you don't have to look that far. Some of us just got to look across the room at your grandmama, at your grandpa, hallelujah, at your great uncle and your great auntie. They have survived some things. They survived depression. They survived uh, the earth shattering uh, changes of September 11th. They survived the economic fallout of 2008 when a whole lot of people lost their homes. They survived uh, the, the swine flu there and they are surviving coronavirus. You oh, are surviving coronavirus and you've got to give God glory and give yeah. God praise the enemy will have you focus on what you're losing in the midst of the coronavirus and I've come to declare this morning you better pay attention to what you got left yes what you haven't lost uh, so I hurry to a finish this morning the challenge of commitment in a crisis is the challenge of staying astride a bull in a rodeo. You ever thought about that this morning? You ever been to a rodeo? I had the privilege my, about three or four years ago, the Black uh, Cowboys Association, Rodeo Association, came to Columbia, South Carolina right here, and they were at the Colonial Life Arena, and I took my daughter, and we went to this Rodeo, first time at something like that. Well, I sit on TV on the wide world of sports, but never thought that I'd be in the crowd in attendance at something like that. But it was something happening. It was black folks. I wanted to support it. So we went. We watched these cowboys before they got on, uh, got out in the arena. And, and part of the test was riding a bull. Some of us have been down to Myrtle Beach and there's a, a place on Broadway at the beach where you got a, a, a bull machine where you could get on and see how it feels to be on a rodeo. But I, but I learned some lessons at this rodeo that I think would be necessary for us to understand in this time and in this season when we're trying to figure out commitment. John Greenleaf Whittier, a poet, he once said, within this maddening maze of things, we need that one fixed trust. That one fixed trust is that God 
is good. I need somebody to write that down just for hallelujah. hallelujah. The one fit trust, John Whittier says, is that God is good. Not God fixing to be good. God's about to be good. God been good. God used to be good. No, God is good. They said that's his fixed trust. I learned just a few months ago, it's not something original to me, I heard it in another preacher, an acronym for FOCUS, it's called FOLLOWING ONE COURSE UNTIL SUCCESS. Glory to God. Following one course until success. Focus. Following one course until success. I need somebody to get it this morning. Following one course until success. Wow. The enemy will have you thinking success is being busy. So many of us are busy starting this, starting that, starting that, and finishing nothing. But the devil is a liar. He said focus is following one course until success. You look at the camera. The implements are professional cameras. In order to focus the camera, you manipulate this device called an objective. Ooh, Some of us are ripping and running in this life, unable to commit, persevere, stick to anything because we have no objective. We are like an unsharpened pencil. No point. Glory. Ah, ah. We ain't got no point in life. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. And none of you that grew up like me in school and you had to use pencils. You love when you had a freshly sharpened pencil because they had a good point. Yes. Even if your handwriting wasn't that good, the teacher will understand what you wrote because your pencil had a good point. Some of us both don't understand us. God don't understand us because our life ain't got no point. Oh, Lord. My God. My God. Got no point. <laughs> But the three lessons we learn from Jeremiah, from Paul, from Jesus are about points. Back to my story of the rodeo. I noticed something. Before the jockey got on the bull, the bull was put into this thing called a stock. Ooh, it was a closed in kind of gate, kind of structure where uh, uh, the bull was brought to that thing. And as the bull was brought through the arena and brought up to that uh, cage, as it were, the bull walked calmly to the cage. There wasn't nothing wrong with the bull. The bull, you know, he walked calmly. He walked calmly into that stock. And then once they closed the stock around that bull, the bull got agitated. Glory to God. The bull got agitated. But while he's being agitated, uh, the coach of the cowboy is whispering into the cowboy's ears, giving him some instructions. Instruction. I've come to tell somebody in this season, in this hour, how these scriptures give us some instruction that we need to pay attention to. If we were listening to the instruction before this crisis came, we would be able to stay committed. But some of us weren't listening to the instructions because we were distracted. Can I talk about distraction just a little bit? Can I jump back to my story? Most of us human beings have a curious skill or aptitude called peripheral vision. Now, the reason I put my hands up is because you see my hands up in the cross, but I can see my hands in both my eyes, and I don't have to look to the left or to the right. Why? Because that is an aptitude that is given to humans called peripheral vision. It allows us to see things out of our, our line of view. It allows us to see things that are out of our line of focus. I'm focused on looking ahead at the camera, looking ahead at this phone, looking ahead at this screen, but I can see stuff 
up in my periphery because that's a skill God has given me. That's an aptitude God has given us. If you have relatively good eyesight, you can see out your periphery. Why? It was there. It was put in us for protection. It is protect us. And so we'll be safe. And so we won't bump into things. And so we won't encounter things. And so nothing won't run up on us from the side. Hallelujah. But if you live your life as if there's no reason to be cautious. There's no reason to be careful. I could just live willy-nilly reckless as I want to live. Then what happens? Your peripheral, which was meant for protection, becomes a tool of distraction. Oh. Come on. Wow. Wow. Becomes a tool of distraction. Wow. Remember, it is to help us travel forward safely while paying attention to what's coming up on our side. But if you allow that protective feature to become a distraction in your life, all you do is keep looking left or looking right, looking left, and guess what happens? You don't go forward anymore. You go in the direction of whatever place mm -hmm. you're looking. Mm -hmm. It becomes a distraction. The coach of the cowboy, I don't know what he told him, but I could imagine he told him, get on the back of this bull and make sure you get a grip of something get a grip. that's not moving. Mm -hmm. Oh, shh. Get a grip. Oh, God. Uh, before this coronavirus hit, our God was ringing that in our spirits. If you get hold of my word, if my word abides in you, whatsoever you ask, it don't matter what's happening around you. If you ask it and you're abiding in my word, I'll grant it. If you're holding on to the horns of the altar, I'll grant it. If you're trusting in me, I'll grant it. That's why the scripture says, blessed is the man who has, watch this, put his trust. Yes. In the Lord. Point number one. I want to make this morning. Point number one. To stay committed in this crisis, you have to lean into God. Wow. What? What are you saying, preacher? Listen to the text. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and has made the Lord his hope and confidence. The language of trust and he has made insinuates that the man described in the text is not entering into a passive, receptive intimacy, but rather is engaged in a relationship in which he takes initiative to lean into God. The prophet here is not talking about some of our contemporary relationships where you got a, a dude or a lady and both of y'all mad because both of y'all waiting on the other one to give him a call. But he ain't calling me. She ain't calling me. She, 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 she not checking up on me. And we struggle because neither of us want to take the initiative. But to be blessed... To be like this man that Jeremiah described, you've got to be proactive in seeking God. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. It doesn't say seek him only, but it says seek him first. That's right. You got to stay committed. You got to lean into God. Lean into God in prayer. Lean into God in meditating on his word. Lean into God in faith in who he is and not so much in what he can do for you. Lean into God believing he can do what ex exactly what he said. Lean into God. You can't sleep at night because God wants your attention and he wants you to get him out the bed and to call on him and to listen to his voice. You can't get caught up in television during the day because God wants your attention. He wants you to shut off the tube and pay attention to him and go into the word and, and ask him his will concerning your life. My God. You got to lean into God. Mm -hmm. This man that was trusting in God and put his and made God his hope and his confidence 
he became planted. When you lean into God, the results are verse number eight. He is like a tree planted. The implication communicated here is that the tree didn't just get there by happenstance. It didn't just pop up by the riverbanks. It was planted. That's right. That's right. Jeremiah here sounds like the psalmist in Psalm 1 that talks about he is like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. It's almost a complete repetition of that particular Psalm 1. Jeremiah here is repeating that when he speaks about a man who is blessed. He goes on, not only are you planted, but you're planted in a place where there's natural irrigation. Mm -hmm. Ooh, nothing special has to be done to keep you producing because you, by what God allows to produce water naturally. It, it's not a sheer miracle. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. He don't need miracles. He planted you by a place where you get exactly what you need to survive and to make it through. That's right. Are you being planted or are you being tossed and driven by every wind, rain, or doctrine? Let me go further. He says, its roots are reaching deep into the water. A tree not bothered. I'm going to get back to my rodeo story. I ain't finished with that. I, I, I remember growing up in the Caribbean with my grandmother. And uh, she had a maximum, I believe, of a third grade education. Uh, we lived in a three bedroom flat which was about a thousand square feet total and that may be a stretch and she raised 10 children plus numerous grandchildren in that three bedroom flat that I think was close to a thousand square feet probably less uh, I, I never saw her have a full-time job. I, I, I saw her work part-time on the weekends cleaning the home and the office of a local doctor and probably doing his laundry. I, 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 I don't remember her ever earning a driver's license. She never owned a car. In fact, the home that we stayed in that was, I think, a thousand square feet or less, she didn't own it. It belonged to somebody else. We moved to a, a bigger home. She didn't own that either. It belonged to somebody else. I, I, when I moved to the United States, she traveled with me to the United States. And I could give you this testimony. That woman that had a third grade education, never owned a car, never owned a home, hallelujah, never had a real job, all she did was babysit and watch other people's kids sometimes for nothing. Hallelujah. She has traveled the world. She was able to go on cruises. She was able to visit the Holy Land. She was able to go a, a, a myriad of places. She was able to go through two or three passports. Hallelujah. Watch this. Not because she paid for it, but somebody took care of her. Oh. Hey, can I tell you? That's a person that's blessed. Yes, God. Blessed. Yes. Blessed. Highly favor. But I, I, I didn't tell you the other part of the story. She did all that, but she had some standards. She had some things, some rules that she lived by. She had to make it to church every Sunday morning and every midweek service. Watch this. And if somebody needed a child babysat, they had to find somebody else to watch them during the midweek or on Sundays because that was for church. She gave faithfully. She wasn't a widow, but she gave her widow's might. Oh, glory. 
So, so she never had much to give, but she gave. She taught us all how to give. And, and as a result of that giving, watch this, she is who Jeremiah was describing in Jeremiah. Hallelujah. He says, blessed is the man. Remember that word man ain't talking about male. It's not talking about a, 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 a man with, 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 with male parts. It's talking about human beings. It's a blessed is the human being who trusts in the Lord and has made the Lord her hope and confidence. She didn't want, she didn't worry. She never had a license, never had a car, but got everywhere she needed oh, to yeah. get to. Hallelujah. Y'all got to Y'all yes. gotta get this. Because we have made winning about what we are able to do, and we miss how God can use others to bless us. Glory. Right. Part point number two. Point number two. As you seek to stay committed in a crisis, fix your thoughts, make a choice, and adjust the channel. Let me explain. The cowboy gets his instructions at the rodeo on how he ought to get on to this bull. He gets onto the bull, and what does he do? He straps one arm under the rope that's going around the middle of the bull. Why? Because he realizes I got a better chance if I get one arm gripped than two hands going in the right a different direction. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. You just need one arm. <laughs> You just need one grip. You just need one. You just need to hold on long enough, strong enough, hard enough, determined enough, persevering enough, stick to it enough with one arm, and you're going to make it through. Amen. Fix your thoughts. That's what Paul tells the Philippian church. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts. The language suggests to us that our thoughts are broken. Fix them. Hallelujah. I'm telling somebody this morning, your thoughts are broken. That's why you're saying the things that you're saying out of your mouth. That's why you feel defeated. That's why your emotions are having the best of you. You got to fix your thoughts. I know it looks bad. I know everybody around you thinks it's bad, but you got to fix your thoughts. I think about last night, they had a versus battle between Bounty Killer and Beanie Man. Yeah, that's not some people from my childhood. You know, most of us were watching that versus battle and we're going back in our minds to how it was back in our childhood. How all of us are going through the quarantine. All of us are frustrated being in the house. But after watching, while watching the, the Instagram last night, some of us got lost in our thoughts. If you could get lost in your thoughts watching an Instagram, imagine why you could get lost getting in the Word of God, looking at what God is saying, trusting in what God is saying. Remember what God did before coronavirus. Remember how God brought you out. Remember how God fixed it in your life. Amen. Have you ever gone somewhere driving in your car and you heard a song that you like, but it was real fuzzy and you tried to tune the radio, you know, you turned a little couple knobs, or the knob a little further there, a little further left, hoping it would tune right. But then the further you drove, the more you kept going, the better the song came through. That's what God is saying. Some of us are in that fuzzy season, trying to hold on to that bull, and it's shaking us. It's knocking us from side to side, just like the rodeo cowboy, when he's in those stocks, before they release the bull, the bull gets agitated. Why? Because the bull's got one job. The bull's job is to kick him off his back, get him off his back. The cowboy's got one job, to stay on the back of the bull. And I come to tell you this morning, life sometimes feels like that. Like it's got one job, to knock you off your feet, to throw you on your back, to knock you off the bull. But you got one job, and that's to stay on that bull's back until that bull gets tired and that bull realizes it can't throw you off because you are stuck, you are stationary, you are unmovable, you are steadfast. As you seek to stay committed 
You gotta fix your thoughts. You have to make a choice. You sometimes got to adjust the channel. Point number three. I'm almost complete with where I'm going this morning. As we seek to stay committed in a crisis, I believe we must stay teachable. Uh oh. And in so doing, follow the instructions. We heard what Jeremiah said. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who has made the Lord his hope and confidence, for he's like a tree planted by the river banks. His leaves are green. In spite of the drought, in spite of the heat, he keeps producing luscious fruit. Then we hear from Paul telling the Philippian church, you got to fix your thoughts because your thoughts are broken. Think good things of yourself and think good things of others. And when you do that, you will cause the God of peace to show up in your life. Then Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, he that hears my word and does it is wise. He is like the man that built his house on a rock. But he says, he that hears my word and does not do it is foolish. He is like a man who has built his house on sand. As I close, I gotta just break it down. To build your house is to establish the place where you dwell and abide. That's what Jesus is saying. Some of us have built places of abiding and dwelling that have walls of frustration. Ooh, that have floorboards of doubt, <laughs> deceit, worry, concern, angst, anxiety, all the negatives you could think about. Why? Because all those things are unstable like sand. Again, Caribbean, it gets such imagery. I always used to go to the beach just about every day in the summer. And there's one thing I knew about footprints in the sand. They will stay for just a moment. And quickly the wind will push the sand. If it was dry sand, if it was damp sand, the water will come in, hit that footprint. You look back and the footprints are gone. They were not lasting. Sand is always moving, and shifting. But if you found a rock and you were bold enough to, you know, put some painting on that rock, I don't care how many times you come back to the beach, you're going to see that hand print, that footprint that you painted on that rock. Because that rock ain't going nowhere. No way. Glory to God, the rock ain't going nowhere. As I look at the scriptures, I, I love contemporary versions of the scripture, the Living Bible, the New Living Translation, the Message Bible, the uh, J.B. Phillips Bible, all those new translations. But guess what? King James is just fine with me. Glory to God. It, what am I saying? New translations, new interpretations does not mean it's a new word. That's right. It's the same rock that our grandparents lived on, that our grandparents survived on, that our slave ancestors lived on, even though they didn't get the full word. Because if you know it, if you know slave history, they, put, they took some stuff out the book. They gave them a book that was altered. But even the little bit in the book that they had, they held on to that. And because of that, we are here today believing God and trusting God and knowing that God is able. So I come to tell you this morning, point number three, as we seek to stay committed, we got to be teachable. Jesus says, all who listen to my instructions and follow them are wise. At that rodeo, a 
Tyler Boyd got his hands up under the rope. And then they did something. They opened the gate. And that bull started bucking. Woo! That bull started bucking. Y'all got to get this. Yeah. This is the revelation right here. Life going to buck. <laughs> you going to lose a job. You going to fail a class. You going to get sick. You going to get a bad doctor's report. You going to deal maybe with divorce. Your children going to do crazy stuff. Some of them might get locked up. Some of them may have to go to court. You may have to bail your child out. You may have to stand in the corner and trust the child and love on a child that nobody else loves. Life is going to buck just like that bull's going to buck. But guess what? That, that, that cowboy's job is to stay on that bucking bull. That's right. Watch this. Reason he stays on because he listens to his coach. He's built his trust not in his ability to hold the rope but in the ability of the instructions that his coach has given to him. Watch that cowboy. He was thrown up and down. His legs was flailing. His neck was flailing. His arms were flailing. His one arm was flailing, flailing, but he held on. How many of you can admit you've been flailing? <laughs> I almost felt like I was going to be thrown off. Life almost had the best of me, but I kept on holding on. Glory to God. And then guess what happens? At the rodeo, some guys came out the side of the arena dressed like clowns. Woo! Glory to God. Dressed like clowns. And these clown attired men you know what their job was? To jump on the front of the bull and pull it down so that the cowboy could get off. <sighs> I heard a preacher say it this morning. I believe it's in Hebrews. I'm not sure. I think it's chapter 3. The Bible teaches us that there are angels assigned to our lives that are assigned to help us wrestle the bull of life so that we can safely get off. Mm. Hallelujah. Glory. Oh, glory. Because one thing the cowboy understood and one thing you got to understand, riding that bull was not a permanent situation. Glory to God. It had a time limit on it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. They had a time limit on it. This morning, I want to challenge you. This coronavirus pandemic has a time limit on it. Oh, it seems impossible to some, hearing what the experts are saying, the medical field are saying, biograph biologists and pharmaceutical scientists are saying, uh, bioengineers are saying, doctors are saying, seems like this is going to be with us permanently. But I declare to you this morning, that's got a time limit too. Glory to God. Heard some experts say July and August are going to be quiet months. It's going to go away and then it's going to come back like a roaring lion in the fall of September. I, I don't know how true that is. I, you know, I, I got to trust them as scientists. They're more educated. Although I study science, I haven't been in it like that. They're more educated on that than me. But I think I'm a little more educated on the God who sits high and looks down low and who ultimately created science. Science is really just to know. Look at the word science, it comes from the Latin term sire, which means to know, 
to understand, to come to the knowledge of. And if I know and if I believe and if I trust the God that sits high and looks down low, the Bible says he's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. <laughs> Anything I need to know in science, the answer to, I could go to him and get that answer. May not give me a full explanation of it, but his answer is enough. Paul, same writer to the Philippian church, pleaded to, to God three times that a thorn may be removed from his flesh. He never tells us exactly what that thorn is. It was metaphoric. He spoke of some sort of affliction that he was going through. He said, I pray three times that that thorn would be removed, that affliction would be removed. But I got the response from God three times. My grace is sufficient. Yeah. See, my shirt says, the grace of God, this is an Akan or Ashanti symbol for accept God. Accept God. If it weren't for God, faith in God. On the back, I got the tree of life. Thank you, Jesus. I challenge somebody this morning. I offer you the tree of life. I tell you that tree of life is in one person, Jesus. The Bible tells us if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some people say that's a stretch what you're saying. I believe that wholeheartedly. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. That's yes. what I live by. And I know some people are watching today that are not necessarily believers. They don't necessarily understand God like I seem to understand God or I am communicating God. But all I am assigned to do this morning is to instruct you according to God, how God instructed me. I don't know where you are in life this morning. Some of you are ready to get out of the house like most states are open this particular Memorial Day weekend. Some of you are saying, you know what? I'm good until other things open up. I'm going to stay right where I am. I'm speaking to anybody right now. Regardless of if you go outside or you stay in the house, I want to offer you Jesus this morning. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author. That means he wrote our story and the finisher. That means he put the final uh, full stop on it. Final period on our lives. The devil is trying to put periods on our lives and God continually changes it into a comma because there's more to our story. He's the only one that could start us and he's the only one that got the power to finish us. I want to offer that Jesus to you this morning. He says, who for the joy that was set before him enjoyed the cross, despised the shame. Now he sat down at the right hand of the Father in glory. I want to offer you an opportunity to get to a place of safety, strength, comfort in Jesus. The Bible says we walk in heavenly places. It says we sit in heavenly places right here on the earth. You can do that this morning. Let's pray quickly this morning for those of you who may have been touched by the message. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your presence and your power. Thank you, God, for how you may have spoken to our hearts this morning. We thank you, God, for how you've moved in the midst of us, even in our homes, in our kitchens, in our bedrooms, in our dining rooms, in our living rooms, wherever we may be sitting in our cars watching this particular live. I pray, God, that I was able to impact someone's life this morning. I pray, God, that somebody that's been trying to hold on like the cowboy at the rodeo understands that the bull called life, sooner or later, it's going to get tired. Sooner or later, it's going to be pulled down to the ground. Sooner or later, you're going to be allowed to disembark and go on to another chapter. Challenge you this morning. I'm not the same man that I was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I lived a different life. I almost looked like a different person. 20 years ago, I gave my life to the Lord. For real. I grew up in church. 
I knew of Jesus, I knew his word, but I didn't give my life to him. 20 or so years ago, maybe more, a little more, I gave my life to the Lord, and it's not been the same since. Everything about my life has been transformed. I'm at peace. Don't have to look over my shoulder. Don't have to worry. Don't have to be concerned. Don't have all the money in the world. But I've been able to do some things that I never imagined I would have been able to do years ago. Like my grandmother. I ain't got the nicest house. Don't have the nicest car. I do have a license. But I've been able to travel to some nice places around the world. And guess what? It wasn't always by my funds. It was by the blessing of someone else. That's what the Bible says. Blessed is the man. <laughs> oh, God. Blessed is the man. Guess what? And we're in coronavirus, COVID-19, but I'm planning my next trip to a blessed place. And guess what? I ain't got the money. I got several degrees. Some of y'all know that. And guess what? I ain't paid for none of them. Bless God. The favor of God. Yes, favor of God. I speak that favor over that young person today that's going to college, going off to college, or wanting to go off to college, desiring to go off to college, don't know how you're going to do it. You know, you've been thrown into a whirlwind with all this COVID-19, wondering if you're going to ever get to a campus, if you're going to have to do everything online. Praying for you right now that God will make a way and you'll find your purpose, his intention for your life, and you'll become, like that scripture said, happy or blessed. I pray that this word touch the hearts of men, women, and children out there. I pray that you've been supernaturally impacted and changed in a profound way. Join us again throughout the week here on our Facebook page. The Kingdom Church Love Fellowship Kingdom Restoration Tabernacle. If you are in a place where you can give, where you can support, we ask you to support us at our cat on our cash app. Our cash app is dollar sign love fellowship sc. Dollar sign love fellowship sc. Uh, dollar sign capital L O V E capital F E L L O W S H I P capital S, capital C. We are grateful for anything you can give. We again appreciate our membership for your faithful, faithful, faithful tithes and offering. I will boast about your tithing and offering like never before. It's such a blessing. I am not complaining. I'm not going to talk about you and drag your name through the mud about how folk are not giving. This church is giving. And we're grateful in Jesus' name. And so we know that, that your giving will allow us to do some things even greater than what we're doing right now, especially when we get back to our sanctuary. Again, on that point of getting back to the sanctuary, we are praying to God, looking for his guidance and direction. And we're looking sometime, probably the middle to the end of June, to get back to the sanctuary, we're going to do it slow. We're going to do it deliberately. We're going to do it intentionally. Um, we're going to do it safely. We're going to make sure that everybody, um, it, it, we're going to test.